Christchurch. The worst that's happened so far has been the toppling of the cathedral's spire. Few locals expect serious problems. But Christchurch does have a fatal flaw. It sits on a soft, shaky sponge of river stones and silt half a kilometre deep. In any decent quake, the garden city will shake like a leaf. And that's not all. Scientists have discovered many earthquake fault lines. Any of these could cause huge earthquakes, but overshadowing all of these is an immense super fault further back within the Southern Alps. This Alpine fault runs from Fiordland to the top of the South Island. Quakes on the Alpine fault occur close to the surface. That makes them extremely dangerous. Uh, probably equivalent to about a magnitude 8 earthquake. It's going to rupture lengths certainly 100 kilometres and perhaps up to 400 kilometres long. Nobody has suffered such an unimaginable quake before. It's several probably magnitude 7.5 events for, a, for an, a total magnitude around 8 within about a minute. Christchurch and Wellington will be relentlessly shaken. And there's the possible domino effect, kicking in fault lines from Dunedin to Gisborne. It may trigger other large events within the following years in the North Island Shear Belt or the North Island Faults. Liquefaction literally turns the soil to water and structures which used to be supported by soil will sink. Structures which are buried in the soil will float. When soils liquefy, sewers and drains come apart, roads break up and buildings sink or tip over. Liquefaction will cause major damage here too. And no one knows if the water supply will stop or be polluted by a large quake. Christchurch has got quite a high susceptibility to liquefaction, especially in the uh, eastern part of the city. And how many breaks do you expect? Many, many, many breaks. It was suggested perhaps of the order of 65% uh, of the pipes. While new plastic pipes should cope with the shaking, Half are old, made of earthenware clay. These will pull apart and block up. Raw sewerage will spill onto properties and into streams. We would be wanting to discharge into both the main rivers, the Heathcote and the Avon. It could be up to two years before people can use the toilets in a normal way and flush it. In 1931, a magnitude 7.9 earthquake devastated downtown Napier. Engineers quickly recognised the importance of steel reinforcing and the need to bolt structures together. Within weeks of the Napier earthquake, the Parliament set up a building committee which by June of 1931 had produced that report. In 1965, they didn't really change the standards much. And then in 1991, they adopted the Building Act. And again, instead of coming up with some modern technology and better wording, giving us something we could use, they go back to a standard which has not changed in 60 years. Because what's in there is just a smokescreen for lawyers. So what does Brian Blunt think of his own patch? Oh, I can see little bumps in the, over that window arch where the cracks coming down to the windows. And see, look at over the, just over those windows there, all the mortars come out of the, between the bricks. Yes. And all along the top there. It's not in a very good state. So if we serve notice, we can only ever get them to come up to half of 1965. Half? Yes. It's certainly making sure that those parapets won't drop on you and I when we're on the street. But it's not going to make sure you've got a building the day after the earthquake. Old buildings must be strengthened to just one quarter of the strength of a modern building. That won't help much in a big earthquake. There are hundreds of old buildings which haven't been strengthened at all. But over the road we've got a building where they've started to do the strengthening. They've put some reinforced concrete frames in the bottom, the parapet has come off the top, they're spending the money on structures, whereas over behind us we've put paint on the building, yep. some lovely weeds growing in the parapet. All they're doing is ruining the mortar and making sure that the bricks are just an amorphous collection of bricks. Most pre-1935 properties that haven't been strengthened uh, pose a major risk. Uh, both for the, the tenants who are in them and the property owners, and the insurers essentially won't touch them. And this is where we come to the what was the old uh, DIC building. Now, there have been several alterations in the last few years, and those green columns at the ground floor there are much more substantial than they were, and there's a whole framing system. Today, there's a strong interest in restoring historic buildings. Are they a big risk? Well, really, your heritage list 
to be quite cruel, defines most of the earthquake-prone buildings. When the big one comes, it may turn out to have been a complete waste of time. Because every time we get an earthquake, of course, it cracks a few more elements and makes the building less able to resist the next one. The day after the earthquake, you may well have to demolish it because it's dangerous. Unless you totally gut an old building, it's probably not worth the effort. But Christchurch has its success stories. Saving a building's character and making it safe, like the old normal school. The University of Canterbury Library has been shown to be a typical building of the 1970s. The upgrade on it, which is being considered now, would be to put in more walls to make the structure symmetrical and also to prevent the likelihood of any column failure. Why? Well, I, I believe that as a, a building owner we have a moral responsibility, particularly in, in a library building, for example, which is occupied by hundreds and hundreds of people each day. Why should you consider it morally and yet other people don't? Well, it's a question of money, I suppose. Christchurch Women's Hospital has another building with a shaky future. Research here turned up some alarming results. The Christchurch Women's site was by far the, um, if I can use the word, worst amplification. And they were recording something like almost 20 times the maximum degree of movement there than there were in the Port Hills. The figure is based on small earthquakes recorded in the nurse's home basement. The impact of a big earthquake could be somewhat less because of the dampening effect of loose soil. But the shaking will be at least four or five times greater than on hard rock. The, the results for the ground shaking, does that concern you? Well, I, I think because they are very aware of it, uh, in that sense I'm not concerned because they, they, they know the problem exists and they are working for ways to solve it. Well, it's still of concern. It's quite clear that the Christchurch Women's site is, and the, the immediate area is going to be susceptible to um, very pronounced shaking. A number of things need to be wrong for a building to collapse. Its age and design, the intensity and direction of the earthquake, and the soils below. Soft soil can be bad, but if the soil is also the wrong depth, its destroying effect can be far worse. Usually a building moves at a different speed to the ground it sits on. But if the soil's depth means both vibrate together, the shaking can be incredible. This extreme shaking happens at the resonant frequency. If the nurse's home turned out to be a resonant frequency to the soil, what could happen? Yeah, I suppose if, if the, the frequency of the ground is the same as the frequency of the building, and you have an earthquake at a good enough distance so that the soils really are amplifying, then you are likely to get more damage. Have you got a moral obligation here to warn? Well, I certainly, I wouldn't, uh, if I, f I wouldn't hide information. What frequency does it reveal? So normally you would be looking at uh, perhaps a, a five or six storey building. It's going to be subjected to very severe shaking.